Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you the uh, first speaker of this panel, Simon Knox, who is Associate Professor of Film and Television at the University of Reading. She's our colleague here in this department. She sits on the board of Editors for Critical Studies in Television and her publications include Essays in Film Criticism, Journal of Popular Film and Television, New Review of Film and Television Studies, Historical Journal of Film, Radio and Television, and the Journal of British Cinema and Television. Uh, with co-author Kai Hanoschwind, she is currently completing the monograph Friends, a reading of the series for Paul Gray. And her paper today is also to do with Friends, and it's um, titled Television and Intermediality, Friends and its Unofficial Chinese Adaptation. So each speaker is going to have 25 minutes, um, and um, uh, discussions will be held at the end of all uh, presentations. Thank you so much, and thank you to you and to Tamara for inviting me. Um, I think I should first note that I don't speak any Chinese languages, so there will be some pronunciations that I will apologize for in advance. Um, also, um, as um, Lucia has already indicated, the paper today is based on a book that I'm just about to finish with my co-author Kai Honoshwind, so some of the argument comes from that joint intellectual endeavour, especially in relation to arguments around the notion of intimacy. And I should also point out that I'm a scholar predominantly located within television studies, and my paper today will both reflect that and reflect on that placement within that particular discipline. And I've also been assuming when I was preparing the talk that not everybody here would be that familiar with the scholarly study of television. So I'm going to be doing a little bit more setting up than I otherwise might have, just to help you be able to place the, um, the you know, place my work into the context which it's part of. Okay. Interestingly, intermediality is a term that I know via the work of past and present colleagues and peers, but only really from those that aren't so much located within television studies. In television studies, intermediality is a term that doesn't really have a strong currency. It's not really on the map of the discipline and of the debates. William Uriccio at MIT, he has written about um, intermediality and television in relation to the links between television and the telephone, for example, where he draws on the nature of television <coughs> as a domestic medium. But really, intermediate debates aren't at the forefront of television studies uh, in any meaningful way. Maybe partly because Uriccio's work on intermediality in television has been published in languages other than English, some of it. But just as television studies hasn't been at the forefront of debates about <laughs> intermediality, so from what I can see, television isn't necessarily at the forefront of debates around intermediality. You're very welcome to tell me later that I'm very wrong with that, and I would be delighted. But my hunch is that this is not the case. That absence of debates on television and intermediality is interesting, because on a number of levels, television has been located at an intermediate intersection with especially film and theatre. It has long-standing aesthetic, industrial, and te technological links to both of those. Um, for example, with theatre, it shares the fact that early television drama was shot live, was broadcast live, because there wasn't the technology to record it, and also because television was initially seen as a medium of relay that gives you access to things that are happening, things like a performance. Okay? And some of those ideas are still very much present and shape current understandings of television to this day. And of course, what television has in common with film is that both are audiovisual screen based media and they have many overlaps at the level of technology, production, creative personnel, and also increasingly at the level of distribution and reception. But still, there's this absence on debates on TV and intermediality. Um, partly to do with the fact that for a long time, as I've already mentioned, television was seen as a medium of transparency and relay. It was much less understood and debated in scholarly discourses in relation to matters of aesthetics and style. That links partly to the development of television studies as a discipline. Television studies is still a very young discipline. It started gathering 
some kind of traction in the 70s and then in the 80s and there was a period of flourish from the 1990s onwards. And television studies has grown partly out of sociology, so that means there has been a big emphasis on matters of representation, also strong methodological emphasis on matters of um, context, be that production, industry, reception. But of course, at the same time, television also partly grows out of film studies. And, but it's only been in more recent years that television studies has taken on more of the confidence that you find much more readily in film studies to engage with issues around um, aesthetics and style. And this is partly linked um, through a lot of debate um, in television studies with issues around quality, prestige and legitimation. That has been a huge preoccupation of television studies since the ooh, mid to late 1990s. That's been a big preoccupation. Okay. But what's become very clear to me in the last few weeks as I've been thinking about my paper is that this absence of debates about television and intermediality also very much links to the issue of terminology. Debates within television studies might not be using the term intermediality, but there are lots of discussions in television scholarship that actually have a strong resonance, I think, around ideas and debates for intermediality. And these resonant debates in television studies are perhaps the most interesting when you think about multi-camera situation comedy or sitcom. Um, especially because the aesthetics of the multi-camera sitcom draw on its roots in musical vaudeville and also then radio. So a little run-through of multi-camera sitcom. Multi-camera sitcom consists of a film performance realized in conditions drawing on theater. You have three to four cameras placed mostly on one side of the stage on which a performance takes place under close to live conditions. So time and space are kept much more intact than there would be with single camera production methods. And there is some editing and post-production, but nowhere near as much. So multi-camera sitcom aesthetics are marked by notions of liveness and notions of immediacy, in a way, of course, that draws again on ideas around theatre and theatre performance. And there's also the audible presence of the laughter track, be that from a live studio audience that's actually there, or something that's pre-recorded and then gets just mixed in during the post-production work. And again, of course, this idea of an audience links again to ideas around the theatre. <laughs> but interestingly, multi-camera sitcom has not been understood as a potentially intermedial genre. No, instead it has received rather strong criticism in a number of discourses, including, and I would say especially, scholarship on television. Jeremy <coughs> Caldwell and Jeremy Butler are the key figures here. They've critiqued multi-camera sitcom for its what they call zero-degree style, by which they mean that multi-camera sitcoms are marked by stylistic conservatism, transparency, functionality and lack, or as they also call it, anti-style. Butler sees the single-camera sitcom, which has risen in prominence since the 1990s, as the resurrection of the genre because of its engagement with the filmmaking apparatus <coughs> that, of course, neglects to consider these, these, these claims that, you know, about resurrection, which implies that multi-camera sitcom is dying out, of course, neglects to consider the fact that uh, multi-camera sitcoms have considerable ongoing popularity and success. As one example, Friends is the most binge-watched show in 2018, uh, according to a survey of several nations around the world. So, Butler and Cold will see multi-camera sitcom marked by a zero-degree aesthetic for a number of reasons, which include, oh, yeah, which include the approximate imprecise framing, as Butler puts it, as cameras struggle to follow the action, the lack of stylistic flourishes that you find in films like Citizen Kane and the films of um, Alfred Hitchcock, very interestingly drawing on the particular autorial prestige <coughs> afforded to such films and filmmakers <coughs> to further the argument. A very restricted use of cameras that work to capturing performance in eye-level medium, medium close-up and long shots with shallow sets lit blandly by high key lighting. And a spatial arrangement dominated by planimetric staging where the action is organized in parallel to the fourth wall 
and the x-axis. So a nice visual example of that can be found in the Big Bang Theory, where they're having a meal around the table, but everybody's lined up in a line, just as you would at home. Right. Okay, so that is the, that is the argument. Okay. Um, so, according to the view shared by Colburn and Butler, multi-camera sitcom style is at best cost-effective, but really it's determined by limitations, it's empty and meager, as Colburn puts it. And in their eyes, multi-camera sitcom has no style, or no style they deem worthy of recognition, marked by flatness and, above all, lack. As Butler puts it, the proscenium sitcom with its visual poverty warrants little more than a distracted glance at the screen. In the televisual sitcom, as, Carl, as Caldwell contends regarding televisuality in general, are images that spectacularize, dazzle, and elicit gaze like viewing. Now, I should explain that the televisual sitcom that Butler here refers to is the single camera sitcom. And I should explain what the word televisual here means and televisuality. Butler draws on Caldwell's earlier work, and John Caldwell coined the term televisuality in relation to a very specific moment within the history of American television. Namely that, from the 1980s onwards, he argues, American television showed an increasing preoccupation with style and stylishness. It really became about flaunting your style, be that for different types of genres. Okay. So this is what he's coined um, the word televisuality to mean. Um, and of course, partly, not entirely, but partly that sense of style and stylishness was related to ideas around cinematic, in inverted commas, style. So Butler and Caldwell then view multi-camera sitcom as not offering aesthetic pleasures, but also as not being truly televisual because of the alignment with theatre and not sufficient alignment with ideas of the cinematic, which is defined in very mm, debatable ways, which I don't have time for. Okay. What I wish to suggest is that televisuality should be opened out much more to engage with television's potential intermediality, <coughs> including very much its links to the theatre. As Michael Newman and Delano Levine point out, Caldwell and Butler adopt a film-centered conception of television style, one that emphasizes features such as camera work and editing. And they've also not wrongly referred to multi-camera sitcom in terms of the theatrical, insisting that multi-camera sitcom style should not be considered deficient in its difference. I want to go a step further than that, and I want to argue that a multi-camera sitcom, like Friends for example, is positively televisual, with television understood as an intermediate medium. So, that's with my friends. I'm assuming that we have heard of the show. Uh, it is the most globally significant multi-camera sitcom in the history of television. I would even go further than that. In my research for the book, I think it's probably the most globally significant television program. Full stop. It's hard to argue with the facts. Um, I suggest that, well, my co-author and I, we suggest that Friends is marked by a quality of intimacy, which is facilitated by multi-camera sitcoms intermediality. The significance of intimacy for television was first raised by Horace Newcomb in his seminal book, Television, the Most Popular Art, which was published in 1974. Newcomb's analysis made repeated reference to the use of close-ups as one way to achieve and construct intimacy, because it's able to offer viewer faces, um, reactions, emotions. That could seem to raise problems for understanding multi-camera sitcom as potentially at least marked by intimacy, given the relative absence of close-ups, or certainly extreme close-ups, as well as the relative absence of point of view shots or voice over narration. These are all methods through which single camera production often works to achieve access to character interiority and thus intimacy. But <laughs> Newcomb himself argued for intimacy being achieved in multi-camera sitcoms through the emphasis on, for example, character relationships and also the use of camera movement, composition, editing and the iconography of rooms, especially the home. In multi-camera sitcoms such as Friends, a strong sense of intimacy is achieved partly through the use of style, including the fact that it establishes a particular regime of looking over time mm -hmm. and a particular <coughs> regime of looking at spaces in the home. So, when viewers watch Friends, they look at the same spaces from one side of the fourth wall 
via cameras that occupy recurring positions, heights and angles, and that utilize similar compositions and framings. This engenders a regime of looking in. With the cameras facing into the three-walled set, viewers look in sideways, if you like, through and across the invisible fourth wall. Their eye lines privileged through planimetric staging. There is no marked border between their viewing space and the fictional space, which open onto one another, becoming a shared threshold. And as Kevin S. Bright, one of the executive producers of Friends, um, explained in an interview that we had with him recently, he said that multi-camera makes the show more intimate, making you feel like you're in the room observing, rather than on the outside watching. I think the multi-camera format really lends itself to that, to bringing you in. So this is how the key creative personnel of the show approached the genre. And I would say that this, um, this link, this spatial field, is very much linked to the theatrical um, and therefore it's marked by a sense of communality, that sense that you're watching with other people, uh, with um, other viewers but also with the live studio audience who you hear and I'll come back to that in particular when I talk about our apartment. But I want to show you a specific example to demonstrate how effective this regime of looking in is and here I just <coughs> want to swap over the technology for a moment. I'm going to show you a moment from Friends from the third season and I'm not gonna, I don't need to explain the setup very much. Um, Ross and Rachel played by Jennifer Aniston and David Schwimmer are having a very significant emotional moment. They're having a breakup <coughs> in, their, in their romantic relationship. But you don't need to know the narrative as such, which I'm assuming most of you do, but you don't even need to know that to be able to follow this. So let's have a little look at the clip. I think you need to go now. There's the... No, I'm trying to make okay. it. Okay. This morning you said there was nothing so big that we couldn't work past it together. Yeah, what the hell did I know? Look, look, there's got to be a way we can work past this, okay? I can't imagine, I can't imagine my life without you, you know, without... Without these arms, and your face, and this heart, and your good heart. No, I can't. You're a totally different person to me now. I used to think of you as somebody that would never, ever hurt me. Ever. <clears throat> God, and now I just can't stop picturing you with her. I can't. It doesn't matter what you say or what you do, Ross. It's just changed everything. can see the framing here remains quite wide. Hang on, I just want to... Why can't I? Right, it's having a moment. There we go. Back. Yes. So as you can see, the framing here remains quite wide, never going beyond a medium close-up. But intimacy is achieved through other means. The cameras are positioned along the fourth wall and placed at below shoulder height, emphasizing together with the medium framing the actor's facial expression, expressions and poignant gestures, such as David Schwimmer grasping Jennifer Aniston's hand. This setup engenders multi-camera sitcom's regime of looking, where any deployment of, for example, extreme close-ups or point-of-view shots would be distracting. <coughs> they would disrupt the intimacy that newcomer notes concerning the sense of becoming a part of the lives and actions of the characters how, and the, how, that the viewers see. An intimacy which I would add is inextricably bound up with how the viewers see those characters. Through the regime of looking in, viewers watch the breakup through and across the shared threshold via three camera angles that together offer a sense of fullness of access to the dramatic moment. And that's accentuated further through the camera work. <coughs> For example, when Ross approaches Rachel by her bedroom door, the camera zooms in. At the end of the sequence, the camera zooms out. 
And that zooming subtly conveys a sense of immediacy and urgency of looking and witnessing. And at the end, it communicates a sense of exiting the fictional moment, inviting viewers to process the paradigm shift in the show's storytelling project. So the use of the filmmaking apparatus, the use of the filmmaking apparatus commonly linked to the cinematic, he works in relation to the theatrical space to foster a sense of intimacy. So I'm going to cut a few bits. Um, so Friends' strategy of intimacy underpins its considerable staggering global success. Unsurprisingly, that success has seen a number of programs take inspirations from the show. In America, shows like How I Met Your Mother, The Big Bang Theory, or New Girl. But across the world, for example, um, in Egypt, there's a program called Eshk I also don't speak Arabic, clearly. Um, which, again, draws close inspiration from the show. But my focus today is on the Chinese uh, sitcom I Partnered, which was broadcast live by television. I can't, I can't pronounce the name in front of people. It was broadcast live on a satellite television station in mainland China from 2009 to 2014. It's won a Chinese um, TV drama award for most popular television series. It really draws on friends, both in terms of its humor and storytelling. It features a will-they-won't-they relationship between a shy male scientist and a woman who um, runs away from a privileged background to start a, and works in a career in fashion. And it's received Western press attention because of these issues of intellectual property and copyright, which are really interesting, but not the focus of, of my talk. What interests me is that I Partment significantly differs from Friends and displays a noteworthy intermedial stylistic sensibility because it's a single camera show that deploys a laughter track. And I want to show you a clip of that very briefly, if it will let me. So this is from the very beginning. multi-camera, using a laughter track with single camera shows isn't unheard of or unprecedented. Why can't I get out of this? Isn't unheard of or unprecedented. Um, for example, you got it in 1960s single camera sitcoms like I Love Jeannie. But really in the last 20, 30 years or so, certainly in Anglophone sitcom, it is absolutely rare and quite um, striking actually. Sorry, I'm just trying to get out of the... Tamara, would Try you help minimize me? it with maybe? Would you help me minimize it so I can go back to my PowerPoint? Um, is this, this amazing. And what makes I Apartment even more noticeable is that it's much more interested in the pleasures of intensified continuity, especially in relation to speed, mobility and flexibility of the camera, but the camera moves around a lot, much more than in the 1960s shows. So it's really striking to me that um, it does that and then it combines that with um, the laughter track. It's really unusual. Um, so the questions to be asked then is what kind of viewing experience, what kind of mode of spectatorial dress are being engendered here? It's worth thinking about the fact that the laughter track has fallen out of favor because it's, it's seen usually as insulting the audience by telling them when to laugh. So it's interesting that the show draws on this and what to make of this presence and to think about who's actually laughing in the laughter track is quite striking. Of course, the laughter track links to notions of communal viewing and the experience of being connected with others, as happens with a live theater performance. So I Partment clearly draws on that. So it draws on the regime of looking into some extent here via a sonic connection. And the laughter track works almost like an additional aesthetic layer because if you think about it conceptually, with the studio audience in multi-camera, there is a grounding for that sound, but here there isn't, so it's like an additional aesthetic layer. So apartment taps into this idea of the theatrical here. Whilst also at the same time though, which I don't have time for, I'll just show you a still from it, it also, at other points in the show, um, 
draws on multi-camera aesthetics, which are much more like what you see in Friends or other multi-camera shows, where you get this one-to-one -one spectatorial address. So Apartment has both single camera aesthetics with a laughter track and multi-camera aesthetics with a laughter track, which are predominantly in the interior scenes in the various apartments. So that raises issues concerning texture. As Lucy Five Donaldson has argued, television is a strongly textured medium, and texture is, I'll skip through it, also about the, um, uh, the rhythmic progression of editing from shot to shot. So Apartment has a very interesting texture that brings together single camera and multi-camera aesthetics, different types of audience engagement, different regimes of looking, and also different types of intimacy. And it brings together ideas around the cinematic and ideas around the theatrical. So it has, you could argue, an intermedial texture, which can be understood as contributing to its popularity. Just to finish up for the last couple of sentences, so instead of being approached via zero degree aesthetics, it's more productive to think of multi-camera sitcom as having a style that both deserves and requires detailed attention to the pleasures that it offers. Friends offers pleasures via, via its aesthetics of intimacy. Apartment offers pleasures and different types of attachments through its shifting texture. In doing so, both speak to the achievements and possibilities of their genre and their medium. Indeed, both help to show that multi-camera sitcom can be understood not via unproductive preoccupations with lack and restrictions, as failing to engage with medium specificity, or, if I may borrow a term, as impure television, but instead that multi-camera sitcoms and television's inherent impurity may also be potentially their intermedial strength. Thank you. It's my enormous pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend Steffi or Stephanie Hammerreich Donald, who is a research director for the Center of Culture and Creativity and distinguished professor of film and media in the College of Arts, University of uh, Lincoln. Um, prior to this appointment, she has been Australian Research Council Future Fellow at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. She has served as chair of the ERC Humanities and Creative Arts College and deputy chair of the Hong Kong RAE Humanities Panel. Her book, There is No Place Like Home, The Migrant Child in World Cinema, Hooray, another publication in Yay. my series, World Cinema, uh, won a Choice Outstanding Academic Title Award in 2018. Um, other titles include Childhood and Nation in Both Cinema, Borders and Encounters, Inert Cities, Globalization, Mobility and Suspension in Visual Culture, uh, Little Friends, Children's Film and Media Culture in New China, and Public Secrets, Public Spaces, Cinema and Civility in China. Her current research looks at images of migration, detention and childhood, and she is pursuing a project uh, with Yi e. Zheng on socialist feeling in Chinese culture. Her paper today is going to focus on red aesthetics, intermediality, and the use of posters in Chinese cinema after 1949. But I think there have been some slight I changes. Some slight changes, yes. Slight changes. Um, Do we so, with that? No, no, I'm literally shoving them on the floor, and it's, 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 it, this is a performance. Okay, this okay. is me throwing <laughs> things on the floor. <laughs> Just imagine. There is somebody throwing things on the floor. I am that person, but there you go. Um, so what I'm putting on the floor at the moment are some people's collective um, works done by Li Gong Ming and farmers and students in Guangzhou um, between 2006 and 2008. Um, there's a reason for me bringing them in person. Though I'm not going to talk about them in detail, I just want you to sort of get the materiality of them and to enjoy the aesthetic of them and to see the obvious links for those of you who are at all familiar with Chinese posters from the 50s and 60s and early 70s um, in terms of both aesthetic um, approach but also um, the use of, of slogans and demands. So they're just out there for you to enjoy. Um, the other things I've brought uh, are also uh, relevant for today and in the way the talk has changed somewhat. This is a... Um, this is a kind of part textbook, part magazine, Old Friends, uh, Liang Yo, which was made by uh, the artist uh, Liu Da Hong, 
which I feature, I'm in there somewhere, and uh, this I'm going to talk about briefly as well, so I'm just going to pass that round. And then finally, this, well, fi not quite finally, this is just a book about picturing power, which um, started it all off, sort of, and this is Belief in China, which I, is genuinely something I can only produce in print because... It was done in 1996, and although we did make a little video film to go with our exhibition about belief in China, it was on better video. And uh, I can't find the video, and I can't ever show it to you. I just have it in my head. Um, and what the film was, I made it with Chad Wallen, and it was a, a little short two-minute film which had um, Paul Clay's Angel of History flying through, so we were, we were animating his Angel of History as he flew, and then images of... Chinese posters of the uh, you know, very, very kind of um, very uplifting, optimistic posters, particularly from the uh, 70s actually and early 60s, and then found footage of people doing the same kind of thing. So you would have a poster of um, people digging um, a well in Dartung or something, and then you'd have people digging a well in Dartung, and obviously there's a big difference between a bright, beautiful image of it and actually going up and digging a well in Dartung or whatever. So it was meant to be an extremely ironical film, and we ended it with the uh, Andy Warhol image of Mao, um, so that if nobody had understood that it was ironical by this time, they should have got it by the end when that image came up <laughs> at the end of the film. And we had karaoke versions of the East is Red and the National Anthem playing over the top. This was in the context of a small gallery in Bryson where we had lots of uh, Mao suits coloured in Mao badges. So it was all about, it was called Badgering the People, the exhibition. That was Bob Benewick's pun, by the way. And, uh, and it was in the context of works by um, Yu Hong, Yu Xiaodong, and, um, and people like uh, Craig Clunas talking about his first images of China um, in the 60s as well. So it was a very uh, complicated, intermedial exhibition. But the thing that came out of it that was most um, disturbing in a way, and I'll pass that around so you can have a look, was that Chinese migrant population in Brighton came and wrote in the very not at all mediated, no of their phones with the little cue things going on, just write in the book and say what you thought of the exhibition. Um, some people were very, very offended by it. They thought the film about um, Mao and the kind of our potted history of the development of the revolution and the development of China post-1949 was a hagiography and that we were really pro-Mao and it was proved by the picture we put at the end and they were really upset. So we had to do a whole lot of work with the Chinese community in Brighton to <coughs> explain that's not really what we were doing. But it was an interesting lesson in what you might think is ironic, somebody else might just take as straight on. And in a way, the same thing happened when we did an exhibition um, called Picturing Power in the People's Republic of China. We nearly renamed China, Pina, just to make it work better. But um, which was all um, around the collection of posters from the University of Westminster and, and a couple of other um, uh, collectors as well. Um, people like John Gittings were very important in that collecting process. And this was an exhibition that really explored memories of the Cultural Revolution through materiality. So the posters were on the walls in Ohio um, and in Indiana. And then various uh, colleagues were invited from China and around and America particularly. And they came and they brought one object with them that allowed them um, in camera, so not in an open forum, in closed forums, to talk about something that was very, um, if you like, uh, personal and intimate to them from that memory, something that prompted a memory. So um, a, a, a kind of elicitation project, really. But again, a lot of Taiwanese um, Americans who came to the exhibitions were very offended when they saw them because they felt that it was a direct attack on Taiwanese memory of the 1960s. So uh, it was just a really interesting warning about the way in which history travels and the way in which irony travels and the way in which you can create amazing kind of uh, conceptual environments in which to experience a historical moment. But um, you might need to think very carefully about all the people who are going to come and what they might gain from it and be ready to talk back to that. Um, so now I'm just going to do two or three uh, little readings from another set of um, exhibitions. Well, I hope we thought that through. 
And this was in 2010-11. And it was an exhibition that grew out of work with three um, contemporary artists and art teachers, so Li Gongwing, Liu Dahong, and Xu Weixin. Uh, Xu Weixin based in Beijing, um, Liu Dahong um, from Shandong, but based in uh, Shanghai, and Li Gongming based in Guangzhou. And so this is Li Gongming's Power to the People project. Um, Liu Dahong has done a number of different projects. The Old Friends one I'm, I'm passing around is one we, we, he was doing and we, we joined in with by making a film of one of the um, participants. And, um, and Xu Weixin has done a very interesting set of works about the Cultural Revolution and now he's working on the um, Great Leap Forward where he creates these images from the two inch very small um, identity photographs including the one of Wang Bien that you showed us Tamara into big two meter by two meter um, paintings. And he, he was going to do 80, he did 100 and then he's, he, he's, he's quite, I've written about this in another place and uh, about the kind of compulsion that's in that project. Um, and the problems with it as well, kind of repeating the monumentalism of Mao. Um, and, and we talked about Tiananmen Square at dinner last night and that sort of monumental image and that gets repeated in Xuation's work, even though, again, it's supposed to be critical and ironic. So it's another kind of point where, if you like, the, 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 the movement from the small images to the large images doesn't quite, and from an intermedial movement as well, of course, from photograph to painting, doesn't quite achieve what he wants to achieve, in, even though it's a dramatic and um, very powerful and very brave uh, piece of work. So now I'm just going to quote a little from the opening think thinking around that project and, and where it went. Today, two big mountains lie like a dead weight on the Chinese people. One is imperialism, the other is feudalism. The Chinese Communist Party has long made up its mind to dig them up. We must persevere and work unceasingly and we too will touch God's heart. Our God is none other than the masses of the Chinese people. If they stand up and dig together with us, why can't these two mountains be cleared away? And as uh, Liu Dahong said, again, in, with some irony, let's carry forward the spirit of Mao's story, Yu Gang Yi Shan, so the old man um, who moved the mountains, digging and digging, generation after generation. So I wanted to start with that because... To me, I think this kind of intermedial movement that we're talking about is a bit like that digging and digging, casting round for ways in which to tell the story and to let the story tell itself. And, and I really enjoyed Tamara's presentation because that was what the story was doing. It was reaching in and back and forward to itself and telling itself. So The Old Man Who Moved Mountains is a story that defines Maoist, Marxist, Leninist thought in the 1940s to 1960s. <coughs> it's about changing the landscape of the times, literally by digging out two mountains rather than going round them. Um, I think the English have turned into Maoist, Marxist, Leninists at the moment, and they're just digging their mountains madly, but anyway, Michael. And it relies on revolutionary emotional energy to carry through that project. Once as history, the war efforts of 45 to 49 and earlier, and the second time is anti-history, the ideological battles and violence of 1966 to 69, and the third time as irony, when the Shanghai artist Liu Dahong refers to the old man in 2010 to remind us that although history has not stopped, it has been badly misused. And what I'm sort of thinking about in this is that the way in which the work of an artist such as Liu um, is important not only because it reminds us of the recent past, but because it insists on the continuities between past and present. And again, I thought that spoke a little bit to our intermedial theme. So the deployment of the tale of the foolish old man is an example of a narrative that travels across the decades, accruing historical energy and revolutionary credentials, along with the metaphorical status to which Liu referred. It emerges in Mao's 1945 Chinese Communist Party Congress speech and again through its publication the 1965 and 67 editions of Mao's selected works. Mao's telling celebrates the perversity of the old man's project and equally perversely articulates the insanity of many actual nation building projects perpetuated in the late 1950s and again through the Cultural Revolution. One such would be the Kill the Four Pests campaign of 1958 when flies, sparrows, rats and mosquitoes were targeted for elimination. As another Shanghai artist, Huang Tuho, recalled in 2010, 
there was an extension of Mao's people's ideological war, but it wasn't a war between people, it was a war between people and sparrows. The sparrows were timid, the noise of people standing on tops of buildings banging pans was terrifying. Sparrows can't fly for very long as they have no stamina, they were doomed. Moreover, not only does the story lord foolishness over wisdom, but the triumph of the old man occurs finally only through the intervention of heavenly agents. Mao's translation of the folk tale into motivational tale, a recipe rather for atheist Marxist revolutionary success based on the efforts of the people, is inspired, but it's already deceptive. The story epitomises Mao's understanding of his own role in historical change as a rhetorician and as a replacement for the gods. He positions himself as both the old man and as the heavenly agent, whilst the masses are, like the old man's sons in the original tale, willing to trust his bizarre judgment, although also taking the subject position of the old man and wage war on natural and human foes. Mao was already, in 1945, articulating the logic of absolute power that Claude Lefort in 1986 has described in relation to Stalinism. The place of the leader is beyond the symbolic, achieving simultaneous omnipresence and absence in the likeness of the divine. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to leave that now, and now I'm going to go on to old friends, which um, is going round. So in 2008, I travelled to Shanghai to talk with Liu Dahong, um, this artist whose work evidences a strong and... Un un just move forward. Sorry, that's, that's Liu Dahong. Um, an artist, uh, I came to um, a strong and uncompromising relationship to both the present and the past. This is one of uh, four images um, of spring, summer, winter and autumn. And I just chose this one with the zodiac around, around Mao. And of course, for those of you who recognise the poster from Mao um, coming out of uh, working, uh, talking to the Anyuan miners, um, this, is, this is a, a, a quote from that, from that poster. Um, so Leo's work I think was very, has been very helpful to me in thinking about how the visual data of the past affects the present and in particular of course how posters of the 1960s and 70s persist in Leo I found an artist with a deep commitment to innovation and exploration of style, genre, format a teacher of huge talent and also a man who recognises the power of visual playfulness in his work and that of his students I fell in love with some of his small painterly works, actually so much so he just took it off the wall and gave it to me because I was being annoying and just staring at it, and was immediately intrigued by his thematic essays, textbooks, which are, um, sorry, I should have brought some, but they're about this big, they're textbooks, um, and they combine his serious pedagogic impulse with a wealth of texture, detail, and adult wit. The works really do combine to form a praxis textbook of sorts, but also play with ideas of the canon, referencing both the, the 60-year time span of the People's Republic through the Red Calendar, and by using Mao Zedong's poetry as an anchor, which of course takes us back to O's talk earlier, as an anchor for the passage of revolutionary and post-revolutionary time. But selling the idea of history to the young is quite difficult, and even more so when the young are part of a generation which has been schooled to allied memories of the recent past into a more generalised image of the 60 years of China's liberation. Furthermore, this is a taxed and harried generation which must adapt to constant change and work within the uncertainty principle, which is arguably central to the processes and lurching social developments inherent in reform. Chinese youth are as various as any other population of young people across the world, and all young people must reinvent the world for themselves, or at least try to do so. But the 20-something age group in China, they're now nearly 30-something when, when I was first talking to this, this group, sitting as they do on the brink of enormous shifts in their nation's sense of itself, do have special challenges to overcome. Ironically, perhaps, in a country where there is a great store placed in expectations of appropriate behaviour and traditional attitudes, this generation have matured with an imperfect grasp of the history that has brought them to where they are today. Conversations sometimes betray internalised barriers to accessing the past in which their own parents and grandparents grew up and lived their lives. So how then to talk about it? How to help students think historically? 
So the project that is going around in this book, the um, old, old friends, is part <coughs> of the answer. So feminists have long argued that the personal is political and that the minutiae of everyday life are as important to an understanding to understanding the structures of society as are the great events of history. <coughs> Likewise, cultural historians excavate the work of memory in order to collect and collate the pasts of ordinary and extraordinary people in ordinary and extraordinary times. The best of these efforts use ideas of spatial memory, haptic experiences, and the revelations of talk long after a period or an event has passed in order to capture the moment, to revisualize the places in which real life occurred, and to acknowledge the emotional parameters through which it was experienced and is now remembered. Old friends also anchor our past through emotional memory. They bring to mind a sense of coherence, continuity, and passionate engagement with our own lives. They are as conducive to seeing ourselves and others in the past as is a place, a smell, or a piece of music. An old friend for an older person may be a friend of 20, 30, or 40 years standing. There might have been great joy, sadness, and complex emotional experiences involved in the evolution of their relationship. For old friends are also good friends, liang peng yo. They know you very well. They know who you were and who you have become. They've stayed around for long enough to find you. Some old friends are exhausting and difficult, infuriatingly predictable, or find you to be so. But somehow you love each other. The loss of an old friend is worse than the departure of a transitory lover. The first might damage your sense of sexual value, but the second will wound your history and will call into question the journey you have made from youth to age. And that is very difficult to work through. We know then that our old friends, who may also be our spouses, our workmates, our classmates, or just someone whose life has touched us, are precious. But students can't claim old friends as old friends in terms of years. But that doesn't mean that their liang peng yo are not already crucial to their being in the world. Moreover, the concept of an old friend requires that the student think historically in planning and designing the work of art, that she evaluates emotional intensity against the passage of time, and that she grasps how external events in the past make a difference to how life is experienced in the present. If one's old friend is a parent, how can we paint them without, become, without talking to them afresh about who they are, where they came from, and why they've become the person that you love, but maybe also the person that you criticise today? If she's a classmate, why did you choose her? Is it, is it that her personality resonates with you alone, or is she just popular? Is it that, what is it about this person that makes his or her presence valuable, and how is that value sustained over the years? Is he of his time, of his place, or of his moment in history? So, had certain things not happened that happened in the last week, I would then have shown you a film. And the film followed a student who talked uh, with her mother and made her mother her old friend. And through that process, um, un up discovered an awful lot um, about her mother's own grief from the 1960s and her loss of family and the things that she'd buried because her, her, one of the things that she came up with, which her daughter had never heard before, was when her grandfather, who'd been a Gormantung, um, well actually cousin to a Gormantung general, um, died in the 1960s. She wasn't allowed to, none of the family were allowed to mourn him, they weren't allowed to have a funeral feast for him, they weren't allowed to wear white, nothing. And this young woman, trainee artist mother had never really got over that and it had really infected and tainted her relationship with her daughter who she tried to keep at arm's length and safe. So um, I can't show you that and now I'm going to show you why I can't show you that. First of all, um, this image is, some of you will recognise it, this is Shen Jiawei's painting uh, Defending the Fatherland. Um, it's a painting that he completed in 1974. It became um, a very famous poster. Uh, Xin Jiawei is a lovely man, but he doesn't look like these guys. In, in other words, he's not, you know, six foot tall, but fantastically handsome and defending the fatherland. He's an artist. Um, but he got fan letters from all over China when the post, from young women, when the poster was published and went viral across, uh, went viral on paper, of course, um, across the country. So this was, a, the, you know, the first stage, of course, with every poster as it intermediates, intermedi intermediates between um, the, the vision on, um, as, as oil painting in that case, 
into a poster that can be mass, uh, can be distributed and, and, and mass distributed in this case. Now, this painting had a particular story which relates to the archive, which is a thread I'm trying to build in here, which is, although it was incredibly popular with Jiang Ting, and that's why it was uh, mass distributed, um, even before it was, though, she insisted that another artist paint over the faces and make them more Gao Hong Liang, make them brighter and redder and shinier than in uh, Shen Jiawei's original conception. Um, after the fall of Mao, and particularly after the fall of Jiang Qing, the painting was no longer deemed safe, so it was rolled up and shoved under a bed um, somewhere in Heilongjiang, and it, was, and it was left there. And it wasn't found again until the late 90s when it was restored by the Gutwitz. Somebody found it, brought it to Shen Jiawei's attention that they still had it. It was then, Shen Jiawei by which time lived in Australia, it was then restor restored, shown in the Guggenheim Museum, and now it's been bought for a fantastic amount of money by a Shanghai collector and it's back in Shanghai. So that's that picture's particular story. Um, sorry, and, and Shen Jiawei took part in the exhibitions that we held in, um, in, uh, in Australia, in, in uh, Melbourne and Sydney. And I'll talk in a little bit about the effect that that painting had on some of the visitors, which is very different from the impact of this much more negative impact of our earlier shows. <coughs> However, when I went into my website to pull up a lot of the from its, a lot of the paintings and so on that I wanted to show you in the images, I found that my website not only had disappeared, but that it had been hijacked. And um, unfortunately, I didn't take a snapshot of it because I was pretty shocked. I wrote this to a listserv that I'm part of, just to warn people, because what had happened, first of all it went down, then I clicked on it again, it came up. It had a picture of Shen Jiawei, but with this name, Zhen Jiawen, who isn't Shen Jiawei, um, in the corner, purporting to be this artist's website. It had some very, very bad COD images that looked as though they were Chinese posters, but weren't. They were just very badly done. Um, but then I realised at the bottom of the image there were some... Uh, there were some thumbnails from my original web. So I was like, mm, so this isn't about the domain name, what's going on? I clicked on one and found more of my content sitting behind, but very non-contextualised and slightly concerning. I didn't know what was going on. Sorry. Fortunately, the website I'm on, the listserv I'm on, is full of lots and lots of interesting people, one of whom is a, a data analyst in the States. He writes to me immediately and says, I want more information, give me the thing. I just sent him very little bit of information I had. He comes back with this and quite a lot more data very, very quickly to find out where it's gone. We were very interested in who Greg is. We, we, <laughs> who's Greg? And uh, it looks a bit further. Looks a bit further. And we find this guy. Hello. His little thumbnail picture is sitting in the kind of dustbin of this website that uh, my other my friend, whose name shall be nameless, um, is scrabbling around in his very clever way and somewhere in the States because he was bored one evening. So there, there he is. So we don't know who this man is. He's nothing to do with me. Uh, so we, um, we have a look for him. And it's really terrifying how many people's faces you can test against. So we went all over Russia, all over Australia. We went all over the place. Um, very quickly, of course, because it was a very fast tool that he was using, and we found out who it was. But before I reveal, um, I'm going to just go on. Sorry, this way. Meanwhile, I was upset because I wanted to share a lot of things with you, so I found this image because I was quickly scrabbling around my Dropbox to see what have I got that's not on the site. This guy here came to the opening of the um, China Revolution show that you can't see anymore, um, which was interestingly co-launched with a show about Japanese manga. So we had a whole lot of young people dressed up as, um, probably see them in the corner there, as, um, sorry, these are only thumbnails, as uh, Japanese manga characters. Meanwhile, this guy was so excited when he saw the um, standing guard for the fatherland, he, um, we, he asked if he could sing the song that he'd sung, which was defending the fatherland, um, and got out of the countryside where he'd been um, posted in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and he went to music school on the strength of singing that song. So he sang it again in the gallery. So it was a very a positive felicitation moment and a very emotional one for him. This um, 
Also, it's one of the images I still have. I mean, I do have more, but it, they were also beautifully laid out for you. Um, and this is one of Sui Sin's images. When he first did them, he didn't, um, he didn't have the text on, and we were talking about text early on. He decided he'd add the biographical text on top of the portraits later on. Um, where possible, if there was a living relative, the living relative was asked to do it. Um, if that wasn't possible, either he did it or someone else did it. Okay, so I'll move on. Um, <coughs> uh, quickly, just to, this this is uh, in it, something else that came up, and uh, this is so this is the kind of things you'd want to see but get disappeared um, online, and this is the guy. And uh, I found his number, I rang him in Western Australia and said, please desist. So my website has now entirely disappeared, and so has he, and we think it was a migration scam. So um, that's, the, that's the talk. I hope I've kind of demonstrated the various links. But just let me play one thing really briefly, because you'll enjoy it, if I can. Um, this is a little bit more from Liu De Hong. I think Hong Wei's already heard it, but... and film editing at the Department of Film, um, Radio and Television, University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, and Vice Director of Sinuspi, Paulo Emilio, also at the University of Sao Paulo. She is the recipient, recipient of a number of research grants, the most recent one being uh, the MOFA Taiwan Fellowship in 2017. 
Her research focuses on world cinema uh, with an emphasis on British and Chinese cinemas and on issues of uh, audiovisual realism, cinema and urban spaces and intermediality. She has published several articles and book chapters, co-edited the uh, books Realism and the Audiovisual Media, the 21st Century Film, TV and Media School, Challenges, Clashes, Changes, Phantasmagorical <coughs> Realism, and her latest book, The Cinema of Jajanka, Realism and Memory in Chinese Film, is out just now. And um, her paper today is going to focus on realism and intermediality in Jajanka's cinema. Welcome, Cecilia. Thank you, Lucia. And thank you, Lucia and Tamara, very much for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, also especially happy to have Director John Munchi and Director of Woman One here as well. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really honoured uh, to, to, to speak in front of you um, and I admire your work very, very much. So thank you very much for, for being here. And uh, so I'm going to be speaking about my book that's come out just now. And um, I'm going to be a sort of uh, reading from the introduction of the book a little bit. And then I'll show you a clip towards the end of my talk. So this book, uh, The Cinema of Judge and Ke, Realism and Memory in Chinese Film, <clears throat> offers an analysis of the work of China's leading independent film director, Jia Zheng Ke, from the point of view of his at once realist and intermediate impulse. Born in 1970, born in, 1970 in Fenyang, Shanxing province, located in the north of China, Jia started making films in the 1990s as a student in Beijing. At first, he was largely seen as the main representative of the so-called sixth generation of Chinese filmmakers whose films signaled the move towards realism in their incorporation of contemporary issues and in their depiction of the urban landscapes of the country. Now, he has long outgrown this label of convenience to become one of world cinema's most original and important directors. Thus far, he has made 27 films this is his first feature, his last feature, including features and shorts, documentaries and fiction, and has garnered a reputation both nationally and abroad, where he has been lauded with awards at prestigious film festivals such as Venice and Cannes. As well as a filmmaker, Jia has been displaying what can be described as a polymathic nature. He is a film producer, an occasional actor, the initiator of a film festival, a lecturer in film and art at the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, and the founding partner of four different film companies. He owns a restaurant uh, and will soon open a cultural center. <coughs> he has published books and screenplays, some of which have been translated into French and English. He has currently 18 million followers on Weibo, having become a sort of pundit, despite the persistent tension between him and the Chinese censorship officials, now eased, judging by his recent role as one of the many new deputies to the National People's Congress in 2018. Not surprisingly, he has also been the face of publicity campaigns, particularly like that one on the top uh, left, uh, which is for milk from Inner Mongolia, and that was displayed in the <laughs> Metro in Beijing, and has featured on the cover of magazines in his country, including in flight and in train ones. Finally, he has been the subject of four documentaries, most notably um, um, Walter Salles' documentary, uh, who in 2014, uh, the Brazilian director Walter Salles shot this effective portrait of his Chinese colleague, whom he considers to be this generation's most important world film director. The centrality and importance of Jia Ke's work in today's cinematographic landscape seem to corroborate the polycentric definition of world cinema proposed by Lucia Najib, who refuted the binary division between center, Hollywood, and periphery, the rest of the world, and proposed instead a polycentric, democratic, and inclusive approach to the study of world cinema. According to Najib, this polycentrism is characterized by peaks of creation in different countries around the world, 
which normally appear during periods of crisis and transition. It would be fair to say that Jajanka's work represents a peak of creation within this polycentric atlas of world cinema, emerging from China and responding to a new reality through an original aesthetics. In fact, one could argue that the originality of his aesthetic contribution corroborates the idea that cinema's greatest innovators tend to thrive in periods of cultural and historical transition, when a new conjuncture calls for the articulation of a new language or new languages better suited to address and respond to a new reality. Such innovations are quite also are also quite often sorry the fruit of a combination of technological advances, aesthetic originality, and a political will. In Jadunka's work, uh, Jadunka's work shares a similarity with previous and current innovations in film production across the globe, in that it is concerned with cinema's relationship with reality, springing first and foremost from a realist impulse. Cinematographic realism is, of course, a malleable concept, frequently fragmented into smaller categories or subspecies, and often defined in relation to a particular period and a particular place. It is nonetheless possible to speak of certain common currencies in realist cinema, both in terms of subject matter and its modes of production, which relate to the type of realism observed in Jajanka's cinema. Raymond Williams, um, Raymond Williams's defining characteristics of realism, for instance, were a focus on the contemporary and secular action, and most importantly, a conscious movement towards social extension. In the cinema, this means that realist turns often seek to articulate hitherto hidden or repressed <coughs> facets of reality, uh, operating under a re revelatory principle. In his turn, André Bazin, who has given the most enduring contribution to this debate, identified realist modes of production such as the technique of deep focus and the long take, grounded on the ontological foundations of cinematographic art, as well as location shooting with natural light and the use of semi or non-professional actors as central to cinematographic realism's revelatory principle. These remains to this day associated with realist experiences in the cinema, albeit their myriad forms and functions. The films of Jajanka share an affinity with these characteristics, and he could be call, called of his own accord uh, a Bazinian filmmaker. As a student of uh, film theory at Beijing Film Academy in the early to mid-1990s, Jia had the opportunity to read fresh translations of some of the most important works in film theory that had only been made available in China in the 1980s. Bazin's view of cinema as the art of reality had a particular impact on him, and he became a diligent follower of Bazin's canon, with an early preference for De Sica and Bresson. Likewise, Jia's emphasis on contemporary Chinese and social uh, social and economic issues such as mar migrant workers, criminality, pollution, unemployment, violence and prostitution also firmly place him within the realm of realist filmmaking, one that he claims derives from his own background growing up in the backwater town of Fenyang in Shanxi province. It is no surprise, therefore, to identify in Jia's work traces of post-war Italian <coughs> neorealist practices alive in his desire to establish a direct approach with the real in all its materiality, ambiguity, contingency and mystery. His is a cinema mindful and respectful of the existential link between reality and its image, image between sign and object. From the mid-1990s onwards, starting with analog video cameras, moving briefly to 16mm and 35mm celluloid film, and finally embracing the digital, jazz cinema has been discovering and revealing, first and foremost, the real urban landscapes of contemporary China. This means being confronted with an unstable uh, environment, ever changing since the start of Deng Xiaoping's era of reforms in December 1978, 
which led China into a market economy, completely revolutionizing the country's social tapestry and not least its geography. It is therefore within a dramatically shifting panorama that Zha Zhongke articulates his original aesthetic, moved by a desire to register and to preserve through cinema's unique recording ability an ephemeral space. As Jia has acknowledged in several interviews in the past decade, he is conscious of how memory is a spatial as much as a temporal phenomenon and how a disappearing space implies the loss of memory. From this, he derives an urgency to film, to film these spaces and these memories felt to be always on the cusp of disappearance. At the same time, he cultivates a seemingly contradictory slowness in observation, almost as an act of resistance in the face of the speed of transformations, which he regards as a form of violence imbued with a destructive nature. China's embracing of a socialist market economy has brought with it an accelerated form of economic expansion that also translates into an accelerated politics of time. Slowing down cinema through greater short lengths, the use of the long take, and by embracing a delayed narrative style, one which would disrupt communism's grand narrative of progress of social realist Chinese films, would function on one level as an aesthetic response to the violence of speediness. While taking the realist dimensions of Jajanka cinema into account, the purpose of my study will be to widen the aperture, or rather to drill a bit deeper, in order to unearth other layers of significance which lie beneath the grid, <coughs> beyond and below the geography of cinema. I would like to suggest that just aesthetic and eventually political response to China's transformations in the last decades does not derive entirely from his film's observation and articulation of contemporary issues and their essentially migrant nature. Rather, I believe that it is the combination of cinema's realism with its impure essence that lies at the root of Zha Zhengke's original aesthetic spirit. For it allows it to interweave multiple temporal and meaningful layers that make room for the emergence of memory. So if on one hand a belief in cinema's natural inclination towards realism transforms uh, jazz camera into a source of power. On the other hand, the articulation of reality shares aesthetic resources with other Chinese art artistic traditions such as painting, architecture, music and opera. This not only confirms the hybrid nature of cinematographic art, but also the coexistence of various temporalities in Jajanka cinema capable of containing both the China of globalization and the China of millennial traditions. Bazin's impurity refers to what today uh, has been termed intermediality, that is, the interbreeding of artistic and technical media forms. The term intermediality <laughs> derives from the neologism intermedia coined by Samuel Taylor, Taylor Coleridge in 1812, but it was reassessed and defined as a critical term by Dick Higgins in the mid-1960s. According to Higgins, intermediality described these acti those activities that happened in between different forms of art, leading to new artistic genres such as visual poetry or performance art. Gradually, the term came to be employed to designate the interconnections and interferences happening between different media. At the same time, its meaning tended to shift according to the multiple conceptions of the root media, rendering fluidity to the term whose heterogeneous nature is today generally accepted. In the past 20 years, questions concerning cinema's impure or intermediate nature have become more frequent within the critical and theoretical debate. In part, this relates to the introduction of digital technology and the consequent blurring of boundaries between different audiovisual expressions, previously seen as separate entities. Today, modes of production of film, television, web series and other videos, videos for multiple formats are becoming increasingly similar, with different depending, differences depending much more on budget than on which platform they will be screened. 
This, as well as the incredible expansion of other audiovisual expressions such as video games and animation, has reignited the debate concerning the specificity or the hybridity of film and audiovisual media, leading to questions of intermediality in film and media studies. The democratization of means of production afforded by the digital has also approximated film and other forms of artistic expression, on one hand, fusing them towards Higgins' original conception of the term, that is a hybrid artistic genre, and on the other hand, creating a dialogue between, between different media within a single one. If dealing with Bazin's notion of impurity allows for a wider scope in the study of cinema, my purpose here will be to combine it with the realist impulse that moves Jajanka's authorial output, and that is equally a Bazinian construct. This means reconciling Bazin's ontology with its impurity, an apparent search for specificity <coughs> with a defense for hybridity. Here, Philip Rosen and Lucien Najib's insights are essential to a more complex understanding of Bazin's ideas, where realism and impurity become necessarily intertwined. Rosen explains how, in the context of the so-called classical film theory of the 1960s and 70s, Bazin's ideas had been read as part of a search for cinema's specificity, this perpetuated a redu reductive idea of realism based on the ontology of the photographic image as, in itself, an instance of this specificity, then challenged by structuralist and post-structuralist semiotics. But does Bazinian realism really entail a search for specificity? This would not seem to be the case. As uh, Najib points out, the novelty in Bazin's approach to impurity is, and I quote, his equating to realism those films which make apparent and rely upon cinemas mingling with other arts and media. Thus, he defines as realist films which are not at all subservient to the phenomenolo phenomenological real, but instead faithful to their theatrical or literary origins. End of quote. By doing so, Bazin immediately precludes an understanding of realism as a mark of cinematic specificity and invites impurity into it by way of literature. Moreover, as Rosen explains, the question of specificity would only make sense from the point of view of, a supremacy of the supremacy of technology over aesthetics, thus becoming invalidated once historicity is brought into the equation. Bazin, of course, viewed cinema not as, a reduce, not as reducible to technological uh, determination, but rather as a changing, fundamentally historical medium. By taking these considerations into account, it would be fair to say that the recent interest in Bazinian <coughs> ideas of realism and impurity are part of what Rosen called a more generous rereading of his foundational insights into the cinematographic art, forged during the post-war period. These seem, uh, again, relevant, especially with the shift towards digital technology, which saw, uh, which saw, on one hand, a discussion around ontology and realism, and, on the other hand, the defense of cinema's inevitable hybridity. This corroborates Bazin's awareness of the importance of historicity, both in terms of a particular historical moment and of the historicity of a particular medium. And I quote, Overall, then, impurity entails a conception of the inevitable historicity of cinema and its specificities on the levels of the subject, object, and mediating technologies, as well as their inter interrelationships. Specific specificity is subject to change. Thus, Bazin's polemic against purist theory entails an insistence on the historicity of cinema and the historicity of its specificity. End of quote. Bazin's lesson on the importance of historicity is indeed as crucial as his notions of realism and impurity in the cinema. I believe that the realism and impurity immediacy or hyperimmediacy debate matters insofar as it allows for a more complex reading of Jajanka's cinema. While the realist aspects of the director's work 
have been studied mainly through a contemporary perspective that privileges its relationship with the effects of globalization in China, as well as its positionality within Chinese national cinema and its transnational connections with other world cinemas. A fresh look towards the past and towards varied artistic manifestations can shed new light on important aspects of jazz, realist and impure cinema by bringing to the fore the heterogeneity of its aesthetic and innovation. What is more, a focus on cinema's connections with other forms of art allows me to locate memory and to bring a historical dimension to a body of work so firmly located in contemporary China, the country of intense social, geographical and historical transformations. Therefore, while uh, Zhang Zhang and other scholars are right in suggesting that the historicity of this particularly of this particular new or contemporary urban cinema is precisely anchored in the unprecedented large-scale urbanization and globalization in China on the threshold of a new century. It would be unwise to neglect how Jajanka cinema equally relies on artistic traditions and references that add new meaningful layers to its spatial temporal fabric, bringing together topicality and historical resonance innovation and tradition, the present and the past, the migrant worker and the ancient poet, realism and memory. I'd like to finish my presentation with one exemplary sequence in the film 24 City uh, from 2008, made of a poignant interaction between cinema, music and poetry. <coughs> It traverses this sequence that I will show, traverses decades of Chinese history and seems to sum up the film's intermedial and memorial gesture. <coughs> the film is about a large factory that is uh, closing down, this large factory in the city of Chengdu in Sichuan province, and it's being knocked down to make way for a new complex of apartments, offices and shops. So now I'd like to play the clip, and it's a six minute clip. If I can make it work. And maybe we can uh, get this, yeah. Yeah.
sorry for that, it's okay. So in this clip, it's a clip from uh, 24 City, the film. Uh, the song that accompanies the first part of the sequence is called The World Outside. Uh, it's a song by a Taiwanese singer uh, that was a big hit in China. And it speaks of a romantic breakup and the world outside, uh, so full of new things and possibilities. In mainland China, the content of the song chimed perfectly with the historical moment of opening up and reform in the 1980s, uh, referring to what lay beyond its borders thus appealing to the young generation's desire to transpose them. In the final part of the sequence, of course, we hear the choir of the old factory sing uh, the communist anthem, the Internationale, accompanied by a piano. Incidentally, this part was cut from the Chinese version of the film. It was actually released in China, but this sequence uh, was actually censored. The sequence finishes with the building implosion, as you saw, and as white smoke from the rubble invades the screen, we uh, see the verses from Yeats's Spilt Milk uh, appear one by one. Uh, and I believe that in just six minutes, just over six minutes, uh, Jajanka seems to condense decades of his country's history, relying on the hybrid nature of cinematographic art capable of embracing facts and fictions, poetries and histories, and to render the film its political dimension. So he goes from Taiwan's pop hit, The World Outside, and the emergence of the eye, of the expression of subjectivity, resonating with young people in China in the 1980s, uh, and he goes from that to the international, uh, intoned by former employees of this state factory that is closing down and from this one is able to grasp a multi-layered transition from the collective to the individual, from the planned economy <coughs> to the market economy and the consequent transformation of a whole neighborhood, a city, a region, an entire country. Ultimately this sequence is paradigmatic of Jajanka's work in, in, in that it springs from uh, and is located between the realist impulse and cinema's impure essence. It thus interrogates, interrogates the very nature of cinematographic art and in so doing produces an acute diagnosis of our times. Thank you. rich and, in a way, interconnected set of papers. Um, I found it very interesting how there was a dialogue with Mara's paper that was given before that. Um, and also, um, across all the papers, there were links, which I found very interesting, uh, starting with Simone's addressing the um, the very intermediate nature of television that this uh, doesn't seem to have um, uh, been caught up by the, the um, theory on television uh, quite as yet, although there is a movement towards that, including theatre and cinema, um, through the point of view of multi-camera and single-camera uses and set up within the mise en scene, which I found extremely interesting. Then Steffi moved on to talk about posters and the power, the audiovisual power of posters and, and the whole question of the impact. Actually, I was, uh, as she spoke, thinking about impact case studies and then <laughs> the, 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 the thing to, to set up in, in Brighton and then your experience in Australia as well with reactions from the audience and the different ways of reading um, images and uh, the multiple layers of images irony and so on. So, and then Cecilia uh, gave that uh, wonderful insight into the, the, the whole background of Jajanko and um, how uh, interestingly he establishes a, a direct dialogue with Bazan. It's not as if he was, we are reading him through Bazan, but he has read Bazan and, and then took an interest in a new realist cinema, and um, and how he's very 
polymathic kind of uh, uh, nature rhymes and uh, takes advantage of the, the impionation of cinema and how this also connects with uh, historicity. So it, it's an incredibly rich panel. Um, because uh, Sisa committed the crime of expanding her talk longer than she should have been, we need to steal a few minutes from her book launch in order to take... Um, uh, so that's the punishment that I'm imposing on you. I'm sure you don't mind, <laughs> because it's your own book that's going to be paid for that. Of course. So, yeah, so we, we have, um, let's say, we have until 10 past 1, if uh, Tamara agrees with me, sure. to take questions from the audience. Uh, but you're right that you would not be the only one who committed that crime. And, colleagues here was trespassed. All are okay. punishment, right? <laughs> yes. No, I'm the only one punished. <laughs> <laughs> we all trespass and I'm punished. <laughs> I allow that to me, so that's fine for now. <laughs> we will have a lot of entertainment through here in the coming half hour, I hope. Um, and, uh, but for the moment, we are taking questions from the audience. Yes, please. Mm. Uh, my question goes to Simone. So, when watching the Eye of Parliament, uh, Eye of Parliament isn't it? But, so, it reminds me of a lot of situation comedies in China in the PRC context from the 1990s and 2000s, etc., such as the story of the editorial offices or I Love My Home to Fly Over Jia and so on and so forth. So, those uh, comedy forms were very much influenced by a kind of Soviet comedy forms as well as Hong Kong and Trans, Trans Asia cultural forms. So, I was wondering that in that link, you're drawing a link between the kind of American sitcom tradition and the Chinese. A Chinese sitcom drama. I was wondering how much transnational element is there and how much local indigenous form is there. Well, that's an excellent question, and that's the thing that I'm still trying to find out because I've been looking for scholarship because I, my knowledge of Chinese television is very limited. So I've been looking for scholarship that looks at that, and I have looked through some key books on Chinese television, but sitcom doesn't seem to get talked about very much. Mm -hmm. So if you have any suggestions for where I can find that kind of information, I'd be very grateful. But that's precisely one of the gaps in my knowledge at the moment. What are the, in, you know, the national influences, developments, trajectories, traditions? How does, how does that interplay come together? That's precisely what I don't know. Okay. So, uh, I want yes. to follow this uh, main, uh, just uh, no question, but just uh, um, my opinion uh, to uh, Dr. Simone, uh, because you, you mentioned about the um, uh, Chinese comedy uh, called Ai Qing Gong Yu, uh, I part, part, uh, English Apartment. Department, Art I Department, uh, and Chinese name is Ai Qing Gong Yu. Actually, we had, um, Similar uh, comedies like that, like our apartment in 1990s before we got the friends. It's mm -hmm. called Why well, I Was Just yes. Insane. Yeah. So friends. probably, uh, actually, it's really awkward to say that we did have some uh, entertainment and TV series. Uh, it's their own uh, official uh, adaptation. Uh, it's really awkward to to to, to uh, but it's in, indeed. Um, but um, for this case, probably it's not suitable for the uh, uh, adaptation. So um, probably we can change to the American Idol to Chinese uh, Supergirl, the entertainment. But we have some entertainment and TV series for this adaptation. I'm not sure that I agree with that because from the from the research I've done, um, it. it quite established that the people who made I Apartment drew very directly on friends, also how I met your mother, and indeed there have been a lot of debates around the issues of copyright in terms of um, they focus, the makers focus very much on the jokes and offered, they offered to pay money for every thousand characters of material that was taken from American sitcom and they've acknowledged very openly how strongly they've drawn on it. Um, 
Yeah, so I think that it is, it can be thought of as an adaptation because the basic narrative setup to friends is very striking indeed. Yes, probably they are really similar to each other, mm. but because we have a case in that, in that case and that one is, uh, is, form, uh, is kind of formal um, than the, uh, the friends, so um, it's just in this point probably um, the apartment is not suitable. Because that one in that I don't agree with that, but that's okay. Right? We can disagree. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, I would we'll, love to speak to you later and hear more about the program that you're referring to. Okay. Mm. Well, it also might be helpful to look at Keen and Moran. You might have already looked at that, but about the franchising of and supports your point. But it's mm. um, they were that in the late nineties. Mm. Um, I have a question for Cecilia, if I may, um, about. That striking image of Germany <coughs> year zero and um, still life, the ruins that um, make up a frame, um, a very optical cinematic frame, uh, towards uh, uh, a documentary reality, although I'm not sure Rossellini's image. Um, I, I, it might have been from a studio set. No, no, no. That that, no. that one because he did he did use Berlin, yeah, no, no, Berlin. as much as a studio in Italy, as we know. So, uh, how you compare those two, and was there really citation at that point from the side of Jetanko? This is very complex and actually I didn't have time to go into it, but obviously the, the motif of ruins in Judge Cinema is cinema is, is it's, it's very prominent and of course it relates to neorealism, but that particular um, image from Still Life uh, is also quoting Ho Xiao Xian's The Voice from Feng Wei, which is one of Jia's favorite films, and there is a very beautiful um, sequence where in this Ho Xiao Xian's film where they go up a building and you see the, the city of Kaohsiung framed by this derelict building. So actually the quotation here is Ho Xiao Xian, but there is a relationship with Germany Year Zero, but I prefer to draw a, relation, a relationship between the ruins of Zhe Ke and the ruins of uh, Spring in a Small Town, which is another film that frames characters through ruins a lot of the time. So. Um, it is a complex uh, intermedial uh, transnational um, series of relations that you can establish and that is very typical of judging for cinema. So of course he's aware of Rossellini. In history, he's yeah, a, in the Yes, yeah. But uh, he's aware of Rossellini, he's aware of Rossiel Sien, of uh, Feymour, but he's also aware of the ruins of uh, today's ruins in China, the ruins of war, but then the, the ruins of war with Rossellini, today are the ruins of creative destruction, to use Schumpeter's term, to describe what's happening in China now. But there are also the ruins of China, uh, chi Chinese war, you see. So it's not uh, Rossellini necessarily the only um, um, point of contact here. I think it's Feimu very much so as well, spring in a small town, with the ruined residents of the, of, of the Chinese uh, couple uh, living in these ruins after the war and and the ruins of uh, old China soon to be replaced by uh, Mao Zedong's China yeah. so there's all this and I have I have written about this in the book as well but it's very complex mm -hmm. and it's all to do with how complex he, he is as a filmmaker I think mm -hmm. very much aware of everything that is uh, sort of uh, quoting everything that is uh, uh, acknowledging and and, and and re-signifying. Yeah, this is, this is uh, interesting how it resonates in a way with the poster that uh, Steffi has shown that she said went viral as, as a paper poster. Yes. Yes. That is a transcription of a, an oil painting. But the view from above is the same. And if we can think about the view from above and all that entire landscape, so um, mastering the world with from a privileged side point of view, which is also there in Jezokar, you know, with yeah. the height and the view from above and then capturing the world, and he has a view of the world. And that 
incredible image of the river down below uh, with those little boats lining the riverbanks uh, and that, that sense of power that the people who are on the top have uh, because, you know, and they are in a kind of uh, military kind of situation commanding. So um, I, I wanted to know about this sense of perspective on the world um, as represented in so much of Chinese imagery, uh, if you have thought about that. There was one poster here, there was a poster, pity that it was all collected very quickly. There, there was one that showed a man with his open chest and all his organs inside. I, I don't know what these images were about. But there is something about an exposition of a certain context and uh, there is a narrativity that I'm missing the point there and I, I cannot so I quite think, understand. So if you Yeah, can I mean I, I think more. the has anyone still got the belief in China book that was going around the little black book um, yeah. not the green so one, the other black one. one. Black, yeah that one because I think there's a um if I can find it. Um Oh, no, never mind, anyway. But um, the, I think the thing to always remember about posters is, you know, they, they served a number of functions. And, you know, every poster came from a painting. You know, no poster was just designed. I mean, now, you know, the contemporary uh, China Dream posters, yeah, they're designed straight through a computer. Mm -hmm. So you don't need trace and paint or anything anymore. But um, all the posters until, you know, really quite recently have been somebody's done a painting rather singularly or collectively and it's become a poster. In some cases they were obviously the up the up, they were just done and whacked up and those were the kind of things that were happening in you know the really really nasty periods of the nineteen sixties. But normally it's a process, it's a normal process. So so there's that. And I think so the, the artist's eye is always going to be active there but then so is the political aesthetic that's in play that's also going to be active and I think you've spotted that in um, in defending the fatherland because it is a very triumphalistic moment um, it, it, it's not it's not a completely um, typical poster I think that's why it was so successful because it is it has a very strong narrative the two soldiers that you see were two soldiers that were defending in Heilongjiang and you know, and Shen Jiawei met them because he was in a platoon there, was like a civilian platoon. So these were men that he looked up to as men who were clearly you know, military and powerful and so on. Um, but of course, yes, they did give you an, a massive perspective on the, on the edge of China because you're looking across a, a potential war. So it is, it is dangerous. It's not, it's not a pretend war zone. It's a possible war zone. It's before the rubble and after the rubble. Um, so... You know, that is a, that, there's a narrative there about China both on the brink but also powerful, um, but also very naively so and innocently so, which you don't get in contemporary films like Wolf Warrior where it's very banal and violent and aggressive and not at all nuanced. Um, but, the, but, the, but then the other thing, of course, about the posters is it's about, it's about communication. So how do you communicate to a, a large population, you know, before television was... Um, you know, massive and before uh, radio was always there pretty much but um, you do it visually and you do it with um, you know with either with an instruction or a story or information so a lot of what Li Gong is riffing on if you like are contemporary issues around access to medical care taxes um, you know particular taxes too many taxes <coughs> the right and hitting peasant farmers that was a lot of what that was about um, but you do it in a way that both reminds people of an aesthetic that they've seen before. So, in this, you know, the medical one you might have seen is there's a very famous one, which is also at the Guggenheim, actually. Um, which was, the painting, again, was at the Guggenheim, was of a man lying about to have a, I think it was a tooth operation, but he's lying there looking very, you know, very, um, like, happy because it's a poster and he's got to look happy about it, but he's, he's just, he's a body on a on a gurney and he's going to and there are people bending over him who are going to operate on him so like, the idea of, of using the body to tell the story is is you know it's whatever you know what's the story what's the you know absolute facts of the story here it is so it's it's, it's a very what i'm trying to say it's a very um pragmatic 
aesthetic. But then there are moments at which it becomes gang hong liang, which it becomes overblown and, and triumphal or nervous. Um, so I think you've got both going on. Yes, please. Uh -huh. Just related to Zhao Jiangke's still life, film Still Life and the other one about the factory which you just showed a part of. Uh, I couldn't hear so clearly some reference maybe to Italian cinema, um, maybe Fellini, but um, I was just thinking of a comparison, maybe an influence from Italian cinema from Antonioni's film The Red Desert and uh, that was I think a path-breaking film in the new cinema um, from Italy and Antonio and his uh, vision of that, particularly through one, one woman, like a model, uh, seeing all the, the old factories and n not in so many words, but in visions of the passing of, a, of an old era and the vague uh, view of a kind of alienation from that industrial wasteland, as it were. I wonder if uh, Jia mm -hmm. was influenced by Italian and cinema, particularly by Antonioni. Particularly by Antonioni and Red Desert. And, I mean, the, the, his three masters are Antonioni, <coughs> who he says taught him about space in cinema, and Bresson taught him about time. That's what he says very constantly. And, and Ho Xiao Xian about um, subtlety or... Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, but, yeah. So definitely, yeah, he's, he quotes Antonioni a lot in his uh, work. So he's definitely someone who's, uh, who's there, very much present in 24 City and other films, uh, especially in relation to, to landscape and buildings and memory. And, yes, well, really well spotted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, room for one more question. Uh, I guess you would like to uh, draw the context of the po uh, Stephen's uh, poster. Uh, it's about soldiers and defending the land. Uh, I wonder uh, why it was uh, finished, perhaps in 19, uh, late 1950s or 1973. No, 1973. Yeah. So Xin Jiawei uh, was actually stationed in Heilongjiang okay. from in the early 70s. Uh -huh. So his first his first big painting was of a was of I'm trying to picture it. It was of a it was in the he was working in the forests mm -hmm. and it was a, a um, forest work basically. Mm -hmm. And and that one got him got some attention to him. It was a very well conceived painting. I'm sorry, I don't have an image of it here. But it was this one, which was his next one, which caught the eye of somebody who showed it to somebody who showed it to mm -hmm. Jiang Ting and she really liked it. So it was it was I think it was probably actually it was probably finished in seventy three but it was um, it was printed as opposed to some late seventy three, early seventy four. Uh, so it was quite late. It wasn't uh, I mean because the, the, the landscape is in Heilongjiang, very northern part of China. We know that uh, uh, in New China at first China had a very good relationship with Russia, but later on a Soviet Union. But later on, uh, the two countries broke up. So and the, the Russian aesthetics is very clear. Yeah, yeah, the, the yeah. The depiction so of the soldiers, the, the outfits and everything. Yeah, yeah so the, 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 the defending the, the, the fatherland, maybe there's implication to, mm -hmm. to defend China oh, against... It was, it was <laughs> no, it was definitely that. And, um, you know, that, it, that they were on the border and mm -hmm. there was a yeah, sense yeah. of insecurity. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't, paying, he wasn't making it up. That was why they were there. That was why, I mean, they were... Shen Jiawei and his platoon weren't going to do any good at all if anyone attacked. It was the guys up there that we see, they, they were the ones who were going to defend China. But um, yes, it was very much a point of, um, you know, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't a very secure period. Okay, we have to wrap up here. But I would like to invite everybody to lunch and to the launch of uh, Cecilia's uh, fantastic book on Jadonka. Thanks very much. <laughs>